Hi, everyone. Welcome to this Yelsa Snack Break about coding in libraries. I'm Linda Braun, the CE consultant for Yelsa, and here is Alyssa Newton. I'm here with Alyssa Newton from the Onondaga Library in Syracuse, New York. And Alyssa, tell everybody a little bit about who you are. Sure. So my name is Alyssa, and I'm the assistant director and the teen librarian at the Onondaga Free Library in Syracuse, New York. Um, I really enjoy doing all things teen at my library, and I wear many hats, and that's my favorite. That's awesome. That's great. Well, I invited you here today because I knew that you're doing some pretty amazing stuff with um, teens and youth in your community, and actually um, partnering with community groups on working with um, coding, and so I really wanted to give people a chance to learn more about that. So tell me a little bit about um, what you're doing with coding in your library. Sure. Um, the coding activities at Onondaga Free um, start off with a lot of introductory classes for students to learn about computer sciences. And then we're also doing week-long intensive camps throughout the summer when we're partnering with groups. All of my coding activities, I realized, um, came because of grants that I've applied for. So something small like our coding club, which is just introductory um, fun classes for students, is because of a Best Buy Community Foundation grant. This summer, on the other hand, we did a week-long intensive because we got Microsoft to come in and do their USPART coding camp. And then our biggest partner is with the West Hill School District, and through their foundation grant, we were able to buy lots of tech toys, um, many of which teach coding skills to teens. And through that grant, we were able to do a lot of one-time programs for kids. That's amazing. I mean, I'm so impressed that you've been able to go out and get all this funding. So that takes time and also a knowledge of your community to do that. And you've scaffolded it, right, from one to the other as you've learned what you needed. Do I have that right? Like you learned something, you said, oh, let's go get this money. <laughs> Correct, yes. So we first realized that STEAM, um, I know it's a trendy word right now, but it was very popular in our community. So any program that we did that had a STEAM focus the programs were maxed out with the number of kids signed up. We even had wait lists. And we noticed that the schools that I, were, I was working with was also interested in doing more STEAM programming. It's in the school curriculum and the school librarians were really into it. So um, when I got that feedback from the community and realized that I had the same goals as the school librarians, that's when we were able to partner and do more. Um, coding came about because the school librarian and I uh, read so many articles and trade journals and we attended conferences and coding is another one of those trends um, that we felt was really important and, and as you sit there and listen in these workshops about why to have coding in your schools and in your libraries it just naturally fit with our community so we um, use a lot of that language to apply for the grants and the kids are excited about it they get really into it our first jump into coding was the hour of code um, done by code.org last year and uh, the school librarian at the middle school, Penny Feeney, and I just jumped right in and did it. Uh, and the feedback from the students and parents and administrators was positive, and that's why we're continuing now. So did you, I'm curious, because you said the school librarian and I just jumped right in. So did you have a relationship with, that, with Penny already? How did that work that you were ready to do this? Yeah, so it started with STEAM, of course. Um, we partnered and did a maker club together. Mm. So I go over there every Wednesday after school to the middle school and we do a lot of maker club activities. The reason we did that partnership is I was noticing students were not coming to the public library after school because of sports and school clubs. So I thought, why don't I go to them? Um, and the maker club happens in the school library. We share resources, our grant money and toys that we buy, I say toys, but they're really amazing tools that we use. And when school isn't in session during school breaks and summer breaks, I get to take all of them to the public library and make the programs continue. So every week we would do a different activity with the teens and we were realizing that coding was reappearing every time um, when we were playing with something they needed to learn how to code and, or do something with computer science so um, we decided that hour of code sounded neat and we both looked at each other and said let's just do it um, and she did it in the school and then i continued it um, at the public library we came up with these questions ahead of time and i'm realizing i'm going to ask you a question that yeah. i put, put in but i know one of the things that people struggle with is like how i don't know how to code i don't know how to do this so for you and penny like you're talking about oh you know we decided our code there was always coding like do you have a coding background what how does that work for you 
that's the biggest struggle um, for both of us, I think, is right now we're actually at the point where the students are better than us and we are, mm -hmm. we're behind, but that's okay because we're struggling to find the best websites for them to use and making um, a coding club or making activities that can be for the student who has never experienced coding mm -hmm. up to the kids who have already done everything and are looking for something new in the next 10 years. So when we both first started, we try to learn the websites ourselves. So Hour of Code has great tutorials for the instructors, and those are the resources I really recommend using. Khan Academy, Code.org, Google, CS First, I think it's called. Mm -hmm. All these places, if you find the product that you think your students will like, you, um, there's often educator resources on that end. So to have the time to go through those so you can start and do a first two, three lessons with them. Um, for me at a public library, they're not formal, formal lessons, but they're out there for you to look at. It was great. These websites are fantastic and all the resources that they have. Even the toys that we play with, the Lego robotics kits that we have. Um, we have Spiro, a little robot. Mm. We have, um, we just purchased a new coding toy called Bloxels that's with an app. So all of these have great tutorials and lesson plans on their website. And they even have communities where you can talk to other people using these tools with students and say, okay, does anyone else have ideas for us? So we're at the beginning phases, but we're finding that these students love to stand up and help other kids in the class. So that's the big, <laughs> that's wonderful because I get stuck and, and they know that we're all learning. It's not such a formal classroom setting that don't get too scared. I love that you're all learning together. I love that you're giving the youth an opportunity to stand up and teach others like what a meaningful experience and what great skills they're learning through that, right? So you were talking about the skills they're learning that just the presentation, the coaching, all of that. Yay, that sounds awesome. Can I come to that? That sounds great. Sure. <laughs> yes, it's a lot of fun. and. Yeah. You know, we, we know it's okay to fail. We, yeah. Like, yeah. it's okay that sometimes these coding workshops or activities, some of the students will not be engaged all the time. I even noticed that um, in the classes where I bring in community experts to teach. So the Microsoft camp, this was a woman who came in who knows how to teach coding. She had a four day camp and some of those kids got bored and it was really it was a struggle and to keep them engaged and finding ways to get them to come back and we did we were able to get kids excited and keep, have them stick with a week-long camp and what's interesting it was a very different environment when they're in that week-long intensive mm -hmm. versus these fun one-off coding activities with me who knows nothing um, and seeing what skills they're learning and if you have the right goals set up going into either type of program you want to set up, whether it's just the one-time introductory classes or week-long classes. If you know why you want to do coding in your library, even if you fail, it, um, the reasons why you're doing it are still justified for the funding and your time. So yeah. make sure you have clear goals and your administrators understand those goals. Because the middle school librarian and I realized that we just want to create a space for teens to explore their passions, learn new skills, have their own environment where they're taking risks, where they're collaborating, and coding is just the perfect thing. So. It's like made my day. Those are, <laughs> those are, I mean, you do need to know your goals, but I think one of the other things that's really interesting, you said the Microsoft person, she knows code. It, I think it's a great example of knowing the code isn't actually necessarily the most important thing. Yeah. Knowing how to work with youth, how to facilitate that learning, what your goals are, is what I think you're saying is the key, right? Correct, yes. Yeah. So then you're working with school, you've worked with Microsoft. Tell, us, tell me a little bit about how you're working with others besides you know, Microsoft or uh, Penny in the school to um, do these coding activities. Sure. The best way for me to go about it right now is finding the grants. Um, I, in order to be able to pay for these community experts or for them to understand why they're coming in. So the, another grant that we won was the Best Buy Geek Squad Academy. So we had that full two day camp for kids and some of the classes in that camp were um, HTML workshop and another one, I think they did code.org and vid code with the kids, which mm -hmm. were fun websites. Mm -hmm. So I'm still working with and kind of struggling with finding those community experts who are just willing to come to my library and do it for fun. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm still working on finding the right kind of coding club to do and, and finding a meaningful way to invite 
these experts in. Even if it's just bringing people in our community in to talk to students, to tell them what their careers are and how computer science is applied in their careers. A lot of teens have these ideas of what they want to do when they grow up and don't realize that this is a skill, this is a new literacy that they will probably have to know. Um, so we're still working on that part, finding those volunteers, but we're lucky to have a lot of colleges in our community. <laughs> we have Syracuse University, Lemoyne College, and a couple of community colleges that help us out and we're able to get students who need to do internship work here to help us. And that's the other thing I think is really exciting is you're figuring it out. Like you haven't figured out how to bring the experts in. You know it's a good idea, but you just haven't made that work yet, which is okay. Um, it's okay to figure things out. We don't have to know. Yes, <laughs> yes. And our, there's no two classes that are exactly the same right now yeah. either. We are, this December, we're, our code will happen again, that week-long activities, and we're really excited to bring that back. There's students who are ready to be volunteers mm -hmm. in, the high, or in the middle school to teach their fellow students. And we're going to see how interested they are and, and try to figure out and do pop-up programs at the public library based on that. Um, unfortunately, my coding club that I did in the winter and spring ended up being one student and I, which was another girl, which was amazing, mm -hmm. um, hanging out and, and playing with websites. And every once in a while, it would be up to three kids and back down to one. So we, we took a break over the summer and did those big camps. And again, the interest was huge with those camps. So I have to find the right program that's going to fit at the right time of year. Yeah. And you have your experts, those kids who have volunteered to actually help you with Hour of Code. There you go. I know. They're going to be great this year. Yeah. So we're going to do a little training with them and then have them. We're, yeah. We'll unleash them on the school. <laughs> <and> hopefully, <laughs> hopefully they're going to behave. So what advice do you have for someone who might be starting out thinking about this, doing it for the first time? What would you tell them? Sure. Um, my biggest uh, piece of advice right now is definitely be flexible with the types of programs. Um, like I said, I just said, one of my programs, the Coding Club, I really thought it was something that was going to sustain, that I was going to get 10 kids every month or every other week, and it just wasn't working. So I took a break, and over the summer, I had 129 kids in the Geek Squad Academy, and I had a huge wait list for those Microsoft camps. So I know the interest is there. It's just trying to figure out um, the right program for this community and those families, what they really want when it comes to that type of program. So be flexible, try different things. Uh, if something doesn't work, don't think that your community isn't interested in coding. Just know that that type of program at that time didn't work. So don't give up on that. And then my other advice is definitely get support from your administrators. Mm -hmm. It does take time. You're going to have to be able to write grants in order to bring in community experts or get the equipment that you need to get kids excited, and you definitely need time to do the professional development work. I still struggle to find the right um, conferences or workshops to go to and then come back to my library and just be able to sit down and work with those materials that they gave me. You can't just walk into a room and hit go to code.org and think you're going to be able to teach the kids a website unless you play with it yourself. So just give yourself time and have fun with it. Those kids are so excited to share things with you, and they'll be teaching you something new every day. I skipped a question, but I'm wondering if we've said it is. So your favorite part of this is what? The, the teens teaching me. Yeah. I love it. When they come to me with a new website and they have to show me what they made or what they created, it's a blast. Um, and then the, I'll, I'll actually have them teach me what they're learning, so it's great. Yeah, I think one of the things that I've learned working with teens is you just have to be open. You've got to be yourself. We all know you can't fool teens about that. But also you have to be open to, oh, it's okay to tell them you don't know something and let them tell you. You can't have any ego in that way. Correct. Yes. <laughs> That's they know, true. they know my limits. Um, yeah. And it's great to start off with um, figuring out what kids are interested in. What are they passionate about? I actually was a music major growing up. So whenever I find a website that has a musical element to it, I geek out with them and they realize that. So they're so excited to show me that. I have one teen who comes in and he's a big film guy. So when anything is about creating their own stop motion videos, he's into it. It's great. And is there anything else you wish you knew before you got started in this? That was a really tough question when you <laughs> had it on the sheet. 
Um, I definitely, I wish that this was part of the curriculum in my education at the, when I got my degree. I didn't realize that this was a new form of literacy that's really gonna be so important moving forward. So I feel like there is a gap in my education. I'm struggling to go back to take the classes that will get me prepared. But with that said, um, take advantage of any networking event where you can meet coders in your community. Mm -hmm. Even if you think it's something that librarians wouldn't be invited to, step in and go. If you have another teen librarian in your community that's willing to go to these events with you, drag them along and you'll meet people to help you out. Right, so take a buddy is always a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> it's very intimidating, it really yeah. is, because it is a whole new network of people that we are not um, necessarily in the same room with a lot of the time. And there's still, I think there are still organizations in my community that are into computer sciences and they don't think about libraries as their first place to go. Mm -hmm. So just make sure that you're there. So is there anything else you'd like people to know or to talk about related to this work you're doing? Have fun, um, play with different websites and just let the students show you different things. That's great. Well, thank you so much, Alyssa, for doing this with me. It's an inspiration to, I've talked to you before and every time it's like, wow, that's so inspiring. So I really appreciate that you're taking the time to uh, work with, to do this video so that others could hear about the great work you're doing and inspire them as well. So I just also want to remind everyone that we have a um, YALSA webinar coming up on October 20th, which is about coding libraries and learning. And that will be a uh, a follow up on some of the great things Alyssa has talked about. So I hope that you will participate in that as well. Thanks, Alyssa. Thank you.